Praise the Lord, brothers and sisters. I do hope that you're doing well uh, in our review today of uh, Acts chapter 25 and 26. Um, we're going to be just briefly talking about um, Paul's defense before Festus and, of course, King Agrippa. Um, of course, this was Paul's opportunity to defend himself. And, of course, in just analyzing his defense, he really used it as an opportunity, a platform uh, to preach Jesus Christ, to share his testimony. Uh, of course, he could not help but share in the experiences that he would have had and uh, what God had done for him. Um, so we're going to just take a journey through some of these verses. So in Acts chapter 25, uh, Festus, therefore, having arrived in the province, three days later went unto Jerusalem from Caesarea. And um, you would remember from chapter 24 that Paul had already begun um, his trial. It started in Jerusalem. Uh, consistently, uh, the Jews were after him, wanting to destroy him, wanted to kill him. For what reason? Because of his testimony about Jesus Christ. And when you think about it, Paul was a powerful witness not just because of what happened to him on the road to Damascus, but because he was from that religious Jewish leadership. If you remember, he, as he said, I'm a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was very acquainted with much of these uh, Jewish leaders, uh, religious leaders, that is. And um, he was very articulate, very learned. And so for somebody who is so learned to now be saying that Jesus Christ is Lord, that was very problematic um, for the Jewish religious leaders. Because he, as I said before, he came from within the belly of the Jewish uh, religious system. Um, and so it is something powerful for somebody who was there to now come forward and to begin to say, listen, I am very schooled in Judaism. Uh, I, in fact, I was very zealous. I was one of those who, who would have been there when Stephen was martyred. Um, I gave consent. I got legal paperwork from the Jewish religious leaders, you um, Jewish religious leaders, uh, to seek to destroy a faith that I am now believer to. So he was very problematic for them. So he had already begun his trial, as I said. Now he is uh, going to be examined again now by this time, Festus and then King Agrippa. You'd remember the Lord told him that he was going to go all the way to Rome and uh, he was going to uh, declare this great message and his testimony uh, to the very high echelon of uh, Roman leadership. So... Let's look at verse two and three. Chief priests and the leading men of the Jews brought charges against Paul and they were urging him, requesting a concession against Paul, of course, that he might have him brought to Jerusalem and their intention was hopefully they would kill him on his way back to Jerusalem. Because you remember he had to flee um, or he was taken with great protection, great armor and great army um, away from Jerusalem. And they were now hoping to get him back to Jerusalem for um, his case, his trial. And uh, ultimately, of course, as the verse says, to ambush him, to kill him on the way. Festus, of course, um, did not oblige um, that particular request. He said no to the request. And um, of course, Festus was a politician, and uh, like any good politician, he had to be also concerned, not just of, uh, he was not so focused on the moral standards. Uh, he wanted to stay in power. He wanted to be in a position uh, where he could still command the authority and the leadership that he had. And so he was trying to dance between the raindrops, as we would say, uh, try to please 
everybody, uh, because I suppose that's, that's what most politicians I hear try to do, try to please all the people, at least for a time. And um, after the time, then you know. Um, so this is where we find Festus and uh, we find the very persuasive uh, Jewish religious leaders who were hell bent on trying to get at the Apostle Paul uh, to have him martyred. Uh, eventually, of course, as I said, Festa said no, uh, but you can come over to Caesarea and you can make your case against him there. Uh, they arrived, the Jews, they came down from Jerusalem, arrived in Caesarea, and uh, they made many serious charges against Paul, but they could not substantiate any of these um, charges they made, serious allegations, but they could not prove it. And they couldn't prove it because there was no nothing there for them to prove it. If it was fabricated, their intention was to kill him. Um, the enemy wanted to kill Paul, just as the enemy wants to kill all of us. But just if you just look at Paul's life as he sojourned and he is now at Caesarea, and it just underscore again the point that we have made and I have sought to make um, every time we do a review is that God is in control of the believer's life. God is in control. When we don't know what to do, brothers and sisters, when we don't understand what is happening, let us remember that God is in control and that this is demonstrated here that God is in control. Um, so he was brought forth. Um, they made serious allegations, but they couldn't prove it. And then Paul now had an opportunity again to make his defense. And Paul used every moment to point all those who could hear him to Jesus Christ. Look at verse 8. I have committed no offense either against the law of the Jews or against the temple or against Caesar. But Festus wishing to do the Jews a favor, answered Paul and said, are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me on these charges? Of course, Paul was not going to go for it. He remembered that he had to flee uh, Jerusalem because of um, the intention of the Jewish uh, religious leaders. They wanted to kill him. And you remember that. And so Paul said, no, I am standing before Caesar's tribunal where I ought to be tried. I have done no wrong to the Jews. And he was very pointed, as you also very well know, if then I am a wrongdoer and have committed anything worthy of death, I do not refuse to die. But if none of these things is true of which these men accuse me, no one can hand me over to them, I appeal to Caesar. And so this was Paul, of course, no, uh, saying to Festus, no, I'm not going back there. Um, not going there, I appeal to Caesar. It's as though he was appealing to, uh, in our day, perhaps the Privy Council, he was saying, no, I'm not going back to Jerusalem. And if you are not prepared to try this case, then I want to go to the next level uh, of, of tribunal for them to assess my case. And uh, so he asked, so it was Festus had conferred with his council. He answered, you have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you shall go. Of course, Paul was very familiar with the laws of the land. And as a Roman, he had every right to make this appeal. And uh, Festus had no other alternative but to, uh, of course, give in to the appeal that Paul had made. Uh, in verse chapter 25, verse 13, several days later, we are told that King Agrippa and Bernice arrived at Caesarea and pay their respects to Festus, of course. Uh, King Agrippa uh, was higher in hierarchy uh, than Festus. Um, relationship, it is suggested, was not all the best, of course, but uh, Paul used the opportunity, rather, uh, Festus used the opportunity to have a conversation uh, with Agrippa and to explain to him and his wife, Bernice, um, just what was happening. And, um, of course, Festus also had a problem because he wasn't sure as to just what uh, were the charges that he needed to send uh, accompanying Paul. 
um, because the charges were so vague. And he himself knew that there was no there to the allegations. But if he was going to send him uh, to the next level of tribunal, then he had to have something, charges documented that he was going to send. And so he used, uh, asked for Agrippa's assistance in this process of just examining uh, Paul and helping to formulate a, a position to present at the next tribunal. Um, so we could go on these particular verses, verse number 18 and 19. When the accusers stood up, they began bringing charges against him, not of such crimes as I was expecting, but they simply had some points of disagreement with him about their own religion and about a, about a certain dead man, Jesus, whom Paul asserted to be alive. And so this was Festus uh, presenting to Agrippa just what he would have gathered so far. Uh, what is his understanding of uh, the charges against Paul? And in his words, is he, he thought it more than less uh, to be a disagreement and not something that warranted Paul to be imprisoned or for even Paul to die. Um, so that was how he summarized uh, Festus to King Agrippa, what he understood so far from the allegations that were made against uh, the apostle Paul. Um, we could go over um, to verse 23. Um, and so on the next day, when Agrippa had come together with Bernice amid great pomp and had entered the auditorium, accompanied by the commanders and the prominent men of the city at the command of Festus Paul was brought in, Agrippa had asked that he wanted to have a conversation um, with uh, Paul and um, of course, he came as in with his entourage and, and the great pomp here really talks about uh, just the ceremonial aspect of um, this gathering. Uh, King Agrippa, of course, um, the quote and good majesty to them. And so there was a certain um, setting, a certain expectation that had to be observed because of his status. So of course, the case started or this level of the tribunal um, started, Paul had an opportunity after he was brought in uh, to, to give an account uh, to King Agrippa. King Agrippa and all you gentlemen here present with us, you behold this man about whom all the people of the Jews appeal to me, both at Jerusalem and here, loudly declaring that he ought not to live any longer. Uh, but I have found that he had committed nothing worthy of death and since himself, he himself appealed to the emperor, I decided to send him. Yet I have nothing definite about him to write to my Lord. Therefore, I have brought him before you all, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after the investigation has taken place, I may have somewhat to write. So you see, is like a fact-finding mission. Um, help me to decipher what I can put together. If I'm going to send him to the emperor, then I need to have something substantial uh, to present um, to the emperor. Now, if you go over to verse um, one of chapter 26, and Agrippa, King Agrippa now said to Paul, you are permitted to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and proceeded to make his defense. And um, look at the confident son of God. In regard to all the things of which I am accused by the Jews, I consider myself fortunate, King Agrippa, that I am about to make my defense before you today, especially because you are an expert in all the customs and questions among the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. And so that is Paul's opening statement. Um, of course, as Paul said, Agrippa was very, very familiar. Uh, he was considered um, quote unquote, to be the king of the Jews. Of course, he's Roman, um, but he was sent from Rome uh, to give leadership to that part of, of, of the emperor's kingdom. And um, so he was very schooled in the customs and practices of the Jews. And so that's the point that Paul is making here that you, King Agrippa, you are very acquainted, very familiar uh, just with our customs. And so you are better positioned to 
understand just what's happening here. And so then all Jews know my manner of life from my youth up, which from the beginning was spent among my own nation and at Jerusalem, since they have known about me for a long time previously, if they are willing to testify that I lived as a Pharisee according to the strictest sect uh, of our religion. And now I'm standing trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers, the promise to which our 12 tribes hope to attain as they earnestly serve God night and day. And for this hope, O King, I am being accused by my Jews. And so he's saying the charges that are trumped up against me certainly are frivolous. Um, these particular charges, they really have no weight because my manner of life and my practices is, is entrenched in, in just the history of this Jewish nation. I'm not doing or saying anything outside of the ambits of the laws of God. I am an innocent man. He, he proceeded because, of course, he's glorifying God in this process. And he's sharing a message for King Agrippa, Bernice, and all the others there to hear so that they too are without excuse. Why is it considered incredible among your people if God raised the dead? If God does raise the dead? Because again, he's bringing up, and if you remember um, the great problem that these Jews were having with him, uh, the large majority was because he's preaching Jesus. And as you heard earlier, Festus said, oh, it's some disagreement about some Jesus that, that it was dead, that Paul claimed to be alive. And so the crux of the matter is that they are refuting Jesus Christ and the fact that he's alive. And Paul is saying, no, he's not dead, he's alive. So they were refuting whether or not he's alive. Paul is saying he is alive. Of course, the Jews are saying he's not. And so Paul continued his argument. So then I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. And as I punished them often in all synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme. And being furious, enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. I tried my best to extinguish um, this sect, but in the midst of my attempt to cause them to blaspheme against their God, to reject him, they were steadfast. And I was furious, I was enraged by that. And so I pursued them even to foreign cities. Paul is of course recounting now just what he was involved in, his crusade against the Christians. While thus engaged as I was journeying to Damascus with authority and commission of the chief priests at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, uh, brighter than the sun shining all around me and those who were journeying with me. And so he's recounting what transpired. He is speaking to here in verse 14, uh, what he heard the Lord saying to him in the Hebrew dialect. Um, he's just going through the process of what happened and he's given a full testimony. Um, the revelation when Jehovah said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuted and just what transpired thereafter. He's saying, listen, this is how I became who I am because of my encounter, because Jehovah of the whole Testament revealed himself to me as Jesus Christ. And so I have spent my life I spent my life seeking to follow him ever after. Consequently, King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision, but kept declaring both to those of Damascus first and also at Jerusalem and then throughout all the region of Judea, even to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. So he is line by line explaining what transpired the revelations he had, and then what his message was. His message was that all men, Jews, Gentiles, all men in the region of Judea and wherever you went, their responsibility was now to turn to God. And they had to start that process 
by repenting. For this reason, some Jews seized me in the temple and tried to put me to death. So I was just doing what I'm supposed to do, observing the laws of God. And in the process, Paul said of doing this, um, there were people who were hostile and wanted to kill me, not because I uh, disobeyed or I failed to observe some custom as they are suggesting. They were just mad because I am proclaim, proclaiming this great message of Jesus Christ. And so having obtained help from God, I stand to this day testifying both a small and great, stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place, that the Christ was to suffer and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he should be the first to proclaim life, both to the Jewish people, Jewish people and to the Gentiles. He's just recounting what transpired and know what his responsibility is to all people. And, and he was reasoning with Festus, with Agrippa, and all the leaders that, that were gathered there that, listen, if you just assess the case, there is no basis why they, I should be killed because I have done nothing that is deserving of death. And you'll hear him talk a little later that, listen, if I did something that is worthy of death, then go ahead and kill me. Uh, but I did not do anything deserving uh, of death. And while Paul was saying this in his defense, Festus said in a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you mad. Of course, Festus had a problem. Uh, he couldn't believe this great uh, revelation of which Paul spoke of. And Festus was a familiar uh, to some extent with, of course, Paul's learning. Of course, he, as I said, he was in the high echelon of uh, the religious, uh, the Jewish religious leaders. You know, he was a Pharisee of Pharisee. He, you know, he was a young man, but he was very advanced, very senior uh, because of his zeal and his commitment to excellence. Um, so Festus's position was you are out of your mind. You are getting insane. All the learning that you have had um, is taking its toll. It's making you mad. Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I utter words of sober truth. Look at that. I utter words of sober truth. For the king knows about these matters, and I speak to him also with confidence, since I'm persuaded that none of these things escape his notice. For this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. And so he focused, pivoted, focused first at Festus and said, listen, Festus, I am not mad. You know the wranglings. You heard the stories. You know what transpired. Whether you want to believe this or not, it's on you. But what I am declaring was not done in a corner. This was something that was done um, in private, plain view of all. You know about it. And of course, then he pivoted and addressed King Agrippa specifically. Do you believe the prophets? Isn't that powerful? And he didn't wait for an answer. I know that you do. You believe the prophets. Agrippa was familiar with the writings, the Jewish writings. As I said before, Agrippa was like the king of the Jews in that sense. He had responsibility to oversee from Rome's perspective uh, the Jew and the Jewish territory. And so was very familiar with their culture and their practice. And it was for that reason that Festus was very excited mm -hmm. to bring King Agrippa in um, because he's very knowledgeable about the systems, uh, religious systems of the Jews. So Paul said, I know that you do. Isn't that something? Paul was a soul winner in the midst of the trial where his life supposedly hang in the balance. He is seeking to minister to somebody to lead him to Jesus Christ. What a powerful testimony. What a powerful life, the Apostle Paul. Uh, it's just something. This is thousands of years ago, but every time you read it, you're so, I'm just so inspired by the quality of life that this man lived. Powerful, simply powerful. And let's go to the next couple of verses. And Agrippa replied to Paul, 
in a short time, you will persuade me to become a Christian. <laughs> so Agrippa understood what Paul's intention was. Paul was on trial, supposedly, but he was using the opportunity to evangelize, to be a witness. And King Agrippa understood him to be trying to do that. And so he was asking, do you expect to convert me, persuade me to become a Christian in such a short time? Let's look on. Paul said, I would to God that whether in a short or long time, not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. I wish you were like me, except for the bonds that supposedly is confining me. I, I wish you were like me. I wish you had the experience that I had. I, I wish that you would come in contact with Jesus Christ just as though I did and impact your world just as though I'm seeking to do. I wish you were like me without the chains that I've got. Powerful persuasive, he is anointed, focused. In the midst of a moment when it would have been so easy to become distracted by a situation, he was still focused on the cause of Christ. That is just simply powerful. Let's look at the other couple of verses. And the king arose and the governor and Bernice and those who were sitting with them and when they are drawn aside, they began talking to one another, saying, This man is not doing anything worthy of death or imprisonment. There is nothing that they said or he testified to that makes him worthy of death or even the imprisonment that he has now. He is, is clean. He is innocent. Let's look at the other. And Agrippa said to Festus, This man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. So Agrippa said he could have been freed if he had not, you know, appealed to the highest court. But this was God's will, if you remember. God wanted him to stand before the emperor and others and share this great message. And so, of course, Agrippa is saying this. Agrippa is an unconverted Jew. He's talking a, a good talk, isn't he? But Paul is on mission. He is staying on mission. And the truth is that they could not kill Paul. Paul's life, Paul's life was not theirs to take. God was in control of his life. Brothers and sisters, God is in control of your life. And no circumstances can be very difficult sometimes, but we must never forget that God is in control. When we don't understand, when we can't trace his hands, we're going to have to trust his heart. God is in control. He had a mission and his mission wasn't complete. His purpose wasn't complete. You heard him later in Timothy. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I've kept the faith. That was Paul's testimony. But, but at this juncture, he had not yet finished his course. He still had work to do. He still had ministry to do. And I want to encourage you, whatever you're faced with today, keep looking, keep believing, keep trusting God. God is in control of your life. God has the final say. We have got to believe that. Let me close out with this. I've said it perhaps a thousand times. Say it one last time in this review. God is in control. Say that to yourself. Regardless of what you're faced with, regardless of what is happening, you would never forget this truth. Our God, the Lord Jesus Christ, is in control. What did David say? If I make my bed in hell, behold, Lord, thou art there. The Lord bless you. And until we meet again, Maranatha. <laughs>